Hello, my name is Dan Keen. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. First of all, thank you so much for your patience. I've had some really hard times in the last couple of weeks that have meant that sitting in front of a camera and being charismatic has been unbelievably difficult. I have tried, this is the third take actually, um, but I've just really, really struggled. So thank you for your patience. Now this week, I'm gonna be answering a question from a patron, a guy called Rory Edge. And I was really grateful for his question because I realized that there was a slight hole in my production uh, tutorials here on YouTube. You see, I do a lot of stuff with my string instruments. I do a lot of production for sample libraries, things like that. And speaking of sample libraries, the BLM Piano Toolkit is coming and it is coming soon. But because of these various things that have happened in my personal life, it's just been really hard to do anything music related. But anyway, it is coming. It will be with you soon. Um, and thank you all for your messages of support. I really appreciate that. In one area of my studio, I have my drum corner. And very rarely I get the opportunity just to take all of my microphones down from stands, throw them in front of an instrument and see what works best. But Rory Edge's question was in regards to the particular drum programming or the drum production that I tend to do. So I decided to record a little piece of music, add some drum parts to it with 10 microphones. Now don't be daunted by the number because for a long time I only had one microphone and I do believe that you can record a great sounding kit with just one mic. For me personally, I just like to have options and for the purposes of this demonstration and experiment I wanted to try some staples that I use all the time and then experiment with some miscellaneous ones that maybe you haven't tried before or some techniques that you haven't tried before. Now I've got three little tips for you to sort of help get started with drum recording. The first of which is to clear your microphones as far out of the drummer as possible. I know that's an obvious one, but you wouldn't believe the number of times I've put drum mics up and then had a drummer hit them. I prefer to play drums myself, and um, I think the reason for this is because I know I'm not gonna hit my microphone. So that's the first tip. The second tip is if you wanna get a little bit more definition with your overheads, I'd recommend experimenting with adjusting the height of them. So to begin with, if you raise them really quite high above the cymbals, you're gonna get much more of the cymbal wash. Whereas if it's closer to the kit, you're gonna get a punchier, sort of more drum signature, which might be what you want or maybe isn't what you want. The next thing is to vary angles, and particularly if you've got a microphone that you're unsure about where to position it, I would say just direct it towards the snare drum or the kick drum, and you're probably going to end up with a pretty good sound of the general drum kit. For me this time, I'm experimenting with a new position on my hi-hat microphone. By positioning it about a, a foot and a half above the hi-hat, but directing it towards the snare drum, I'm reducing that kind of high-end piercing sound that you get from the hi-hat, and instead introducing some really nice characteristics from the snare drum, something that I'm actually quite pleased with. Now in front of the kit, I've got these 10 mics, the first of which being the kick microphone, which is an AK g d112 on the snare top i've got a shaw sm57 which is positioned actually quite high above the drum and pointing directly towards the center underneath i've got one of three akg d40s this is pointing directly at the snares of the drum then on the toms i've got the remaining two d40s so this picks up a fairly nice dynamic sound it's not the best microphone but it's what i've got available to me and i quite like how it works particularly on toms then above the hi-hat i'm using an akg c4 451B microphone. This is a small diaphragm condenser, so it's going to pick up that high attenuated high frequency sound and um, maybe sound a little bit bright, although it's not actually bright, it just responds well to high frequencies. Next, above the kick drum shell, I've got the Greg Wells Fat Mic Technique, which is an AKG C214, so a large diaphragm condenser, and I've placed it about a foot and a half above the kick drum shell, and the idea here is just to bring out some of the low rumble that you maybe miss with those close microphones. It's worth saying that low resonance tends to build up at distance, so if you've got something that's really, really close, you're going to get the punch and the attack, but you might not get the sort of the rumble that comes afterwards. Next, over my shoulder, I've got an Audio-Technica AT2020. This is a large large diaphragm condenser that I reviewed recently on my channel, so if you haven't seen already, check out my review above. For £85, it's an absolute steal, and it has that really nice kind of high frequency response to the drumsticks hitting against the skin, so it picks out the thwack, if that's a word. For my overheads, I'm using a pair of AKG C430s, so these are small diaphragm condensers. I don't particularly like how they sound, they've got a very bright sound to them that don't tend to favour the low end of the kick and the lower toms, but it works really well just for picking up the general signature of the stereo image. 
Finally, as my room microphone, I'm using this, the AKG C214. And this is a large diaphragm condenser mic that just sort of picks up the reflections around the room. Because this is quite a small room, it's only about three meters away from the drum kit, but really I'd prefer a stereo pair and pushing it a little bit further back if I were in a bigger studio. Now, one tip I'd really recommend when it comes to positioning your microphones, particularly the overheads, is to consider what your stereo image is going to look like. Now, most people sort of think of the drum kit as being from the sort of the hi-hats on one side to the outer end of the ride on another side with the kick drum directly in the center. Now this works to a degree and I can understand why people would do this but if you look at where the snare drum is typically positioned it's not right in front of where the kick drum is. Typically it's to the left or maybe to the right if you're a left-handed player. So to combat this what I've done is I've arranged the overhead microphones so that they're directly in line with the kick and snare drum. So the kick and snare are now directly in the center of the image and I really like how this is placed because the toms, tom 1 and tom 2, are now sort of equidistant from the center of the stereo image. Similarly the hi-hat and the ride are also at a similar distance from the stereo image and actually a little bit closer to the center which is something that I personally prefer. Finally the crash symbol and the splash symbol are now the furthest away in the stereo image on the left and right respectively and so this gives you a little bit more kind of control and adds a nice bit of stereo width when going for those shots. For me personally I find that the hi-hats are such a sort of ubiquitous part of the drum kit experience that to have it really far off onto the left or really far over to the right is actually a little bit jarring for me. Now for the last half an hour or so I've been showing my patrons how I've created this drum mix, taking it through right from nothing all the way through to something. If you want to see that video please do join me on my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Danke Music. Now these stems are going to be available for you to use but I'd ask that you don't use them for commercial use, this is just an educational thing. We've got Piano, Rhodes, bass which I've been using with the Squire bass which I really really like and um, a pair of electric guitar tracks here. I've also got a shaker and muted triangle so I'm just going to quickly play you the track as I've left it off now and then I'm going to go through the various plugins and show you how I've created the sound that I use in 2020. <laughs> Okay, short and sweet there, 30 seconds, but I really, really like the way that this all came together and um, I actually really did enjoy sharing it as well. So all of the drums here are going through a drum bus. This is a, called a track stack in Logic. Basically, it's an auxiliary track, so everything's rooted to the same bus output. And the first thing I use is some compression. And for this, I have the SSL compressor by Waves. And if I show you how it sounds as we go through the settings here, quite a gentle uh, compression there, about two to three dB. So I've got it at an attack here of 10 milliseconds, auto release, and then a four to one uh, ratio here. I find that for the 10 milliseconds, it gives a little bit more punch, but for three, it has more of the kind of aggressive attack. So it really depends what you like. For this particular sound, I prefer the 10 milliseconds. Okay, so let's start off with the kick drum. And uh, this is what it sounds like on its own. So first of all I start with a gate and this is just to sort of keep things in check to reject any of those other noises that I don't necessarily want. I keep the range really high here on the FabFilter Pro G and I've got the look ahead at four milliseconds here. And that really helps to keep things punchy while keeping the attack nice and low. So that's really nice. Next I compress using the C2 here and I really really like the way this sounds. Um, I'm quite punchy here on the opto style. So I've got an attack here of about seven milliseconds and a release of 40 milliseconds. So quite gentle. I want to get right in there as the note starts, but I don't want to sort of take away from the transient. 
Next, I use the Pro Q3 by FabFilter. And for this, I have a couple of things. The first thing I do is I filter off the very lowest end. I don't want it to sound too sort of woolly at the bottom. I might have a sub bass, things like that, that I want to keep some space for. But generally, I sort of pull this off and actually it sounds, it makes the resonant frequency sound quite punchy. So the resonant frequency here is about 70 hertz, something like that. Now I've pulled out where the snare drum frequency is because there was also a slight resonance in the resonant head that I didn't really like. It had a bit of a woolly sound sound to it. If I just sort of click on this and, um, and show you what that sounded like. Just a little bit boxy, so I just wanted to bring that down. I also had another frequency here at 380 hertz that I just wanted to bring down. Just a little pocket there that I didn't really like. Now I mentioned in my longer form version of this tutorial that I actually really like to notch out in the middle here. So this is 560 hertz. And what this does is it sort of accentuates the low end and the high end. Just makes it sound a little bit punchier. And then finally, I just boosted those kind of beta frequencies. So the 1.2K and the 4.4K. Really not by very much, only about 1.5 dB, but it just helps to kind of bring things out. Next, I use the CQ by Sound Toys, and I'm a big fan of this. This is really just to give it a bit of a smile. So I drive up the, uh, the drive settings here with about three, and then I'm boosting the low end, boosting the mids at about 1.5K, and then boosting the high end, and that really adds quite a lot of sort of attack. Next, going back to FabFilter, I use the Saturn 2 plugin, and I really like the way this sounds. Um, I have a setting that I tend to use, but this is actually a sort of fresh one from when I was doing it live. So at the bottom here, I've got the warm tape, and this is just below where the resonant frequency would be. And I basically turn up the drive until it starts to sort of distort. I don't want it to sound like, you know, I kind of, I still want it to have a little bit more punch than that. Next, in the middle band, I'm using the uh, tube, and I'm actually saturating pretty heavily here. But I did bring it down a little bit, so it sort of accentuates the low end and the high end. Finally, on the high end, uh, I'm using warm tape, but I've pulled it down a little bit as well. This just gives it a real kind of upfront, saturated sound. And finally, I put it through the FabFilter Reverb. This is the Room for Kick Sustain setting, which I particularly liked. It doesn't sound very natural on its own, but it works well within the mix. You notice here that I'm keeping my stereo width nice and close. I use the overheads and the room to give it the width that it needs. Next, let's move on to the snare drum. And with this, it's a steel snare, so it doesn't really have the sort of low-end punch that I'd normally hope for. So I'm using a gate once again. I'm using a compressor as well. I'm using the Opto style compressor again with an attack of six milliseconds and a release of 47 milliseconds. So what I'm doing here with this EQ is, first of all, I'm pulling off any of the low end rumble, and then I'm boosting the fundamental frequency, which is about 150 hertz here. I'm then taking away various frequencies. This is nothing in particular. This is just stuff that I kind of find that I want to fine tune. Now I mentioned in my last video, the tips for better mixing, that really subtractive EQ ultimately makes for a cleaner sound. So apart from this boosting here of the fundamental frequency or boosting frequencies that I like, I tend to prefer to pull frequencies out that I don't like. Now here I've just boosted at 1.5k and this was really just to give the kind of the high end fizzle that you get from the snares. Then I've boosted again at 6k and again here with a shelf at 13k but you'll see that I'm still pulling off at about 20k so I don't want to make it too bright sounding because I've also got the snares in the snare bottom microphone to reinforce that afterwards. Next, I'm using the Saturn 2 again, and this is really just to see how it sounds in the context of the mix. I was finding that it sounded fine, but it actually needed a little bit more reinforcement. So I've gone in here and I've saturated it with the warm tape in all cases. And first of all, I wouldn't ever sort of boost this kind of number of uh, dB, but it really just needed a bit more reinforcement. So you'll see where this comes in is right above where that fundamental frequency is. So all of this below 
is just to sort of solidify that fundamental frequency, to make it less sort of mm, but more mm. And that's really what you get from that kind of saturated sound. Next, I've pulled down a little bit here in the mid-range. It's got that gritty sound that I'm going to bring out later with the shoulder mic and the overhead, so just wanting to balance things a little bit. And then finally, I've got my warm tape setting here on the high end. Finally, I've got a Pro R, and for this, I'm using the Room for Snare A setting with a 25% mix and only about 51% width, so again, quite narrow. Next, on the snare bottom, the first thing you need to start with is a phase invert tool. Because they're pointing in opposite directions, it's going to be sort of cancelling out some of the low resonant frequencies. So the first thing I've got here is an EQ, and what I would tend to say when comparing sort of compression versus EQ first, if it sounds like it needs fixing to begin with, then go through with an EQ first, maybe just a corrective EQ before compression. If it sounds good on the way in, then add compression first and then EQ. So for this, I just wanted to take off the lower frequencies boost that fundamental frequency just because it's getting the snares that doesn't mean we can't sort of make use of all of those sort of lower sort of resonant frequencies I'm then notching out at about 950 hertz just to sort of reduce that simmer there and then I'm boosting at 6k and again at 14k I want to make this really sort of sizzle you can also hear there that it's bringing out some of the ghost notes and I um, I was a little bit kind of strict with the gating that I used on the snare drum. I had the range turned down a little bit, so they are still coming through, but maybe not as clearly as I'd like. So I like to keep the snare bottom relatively sort of loose and also helps to give a little bit more impact with the kick and the tom microphones as well. Next, I have a very similar way of working for both my toms. So I start with a gate um, and then I compress it quite heavily. So if I just sort of loop this bit round and round. Next, for my EQ of choice, I'm using the SSL by Waves. I really like this channel EQ. I'm only using the EQ itself. I'm not using the dynamics or the gating here. So I'm boosting here at 10K, 4.5K, 1.5K, and at 100 Hertz. I just like to bring out the kind of the slap of the top of the skin and then I really like to kind of bring out the resonant frequency. I just find that this plugin works really well, especially for toms. Next, I'm using a setting that I have called Top Lip Bite and this is really just to give it a little bit of kind of extra something something. So it adds the kind of distortion there of this middle band and then the top end just gives it that clarity and that's with the old tape setting on that one. Next, I'm using a directional mixer, and this is just so that my reverb of choice, which is the room for Tom Tom sustain, is still panned over that side. Next, I've got exactly the same thing on my Tom 2, but with this, I'm just boosting a slightly lower frequency at 80 hertz. Next, on my hi-hats, as I mentioned at the beginning, I don't like to have it panned too far over to the left, so I've got this at 35. And if I just play what it sounds like here. So I'm boosting the fundamental frequency of the snare drum. You'll notice there it actually picks up a, a relatively good signature of the snare, and that's helped by tilting it more towards the snare drum. So I'm picking up that fundamental frequency, ducking out a little bit here, which just sounds a little bit kind of grainy. Just helps to clean things up a little bit. Then I've got 3.5K, and then I'm cutting out at 11K here. This is quite piercing. and then just a gentle boost from 17K. And that's really all I've done on that. It's quite simple, but it sounds quite nice with the rest of the kit. Next, I'm sure you're all very excited about the fat mic technique. Uh, here it is, and actually I'm really, really pleased with how this sounds. So this is a large diaphragm condenser, about two feet above the kick. It's just got that attack and that punch uh, that's really, really nice. I've boosted 
to smithereens, the um, the low end first. And notice again, I'm EQing before compression because I want to bring that out. And then I'm just ducking out all these random frequencies that just had a little bit kind of, just a bit of wooliness about them. And then I'm kind of gently pulling off the, the, uh, the high end there. Next I'm using the CLA-3A. This just has a really nice attack to it, but I noticed that it was a little bit too stifling. So after that I added the CQ plugin just to give it a little bit more attitude again. And you can see here I've taken the drive setting up to six. So this sounds a little bit distorted now, but let me blend it in and it's really quite noticeable. So without it, and then with it, it's subtle, but it just adds that weight that um, that I think it really needs. The other thing is I haven't actually gated it. Sometimes what I do is I'll gate it or I'll sort of trigger it to a side chain where I've taken a bus from my kick drum, my snare drum, and then I've bussed it and used that as a reference for the side chain. With this, I actually quite like the rumble continuing and actually it sort of gives a little bit more kind of continuity um, and it actually helps to blend with the overheads quite well. Next, let's move on to the shoulder microphone. This is really a kind of miscellaneous choice. I quite liked how it sounded at the time. I don't know, it doesn't add a huge amount for me. So for this, I'm taking down the high end. This is at four and a half K. And the reason for this mainly is because it's quite a bright sounding microphone as it is. I'm then boosting at hundred Hertz because again, that's where it tends to have a bit of a dip anyway. And then I'm just ducking out to 290 Hertz and boosting at one K. So just kind of giving it a little bit of grit there. You can see there that I'm compressing again with the FabFilter Pro C2. And then finally, I'm just adding a bit of low end weight, a bit of drive, and um, just taking out some more of those high mid frequencies, sort of the 2.3K uh, didn't sound very nice. And then finally, I just used the, um, the SSL EQ here just to boost those lower frequencies at 83 Hertz. Just to give it a little bit more presence. Next, moving on to the overheads. For starters, I had to pan it over slightly because I think the left microphone was maybe being recorded a little bit hotter than the right microphone. I used the, um, the SSL channel here and I really like how this sounds. So I'm boosting at 10K, boosting at 4.5K, boosting at 1.5K, and then I'm boosting at the kind of fundamental frequency of the snare drum. So this is around 130 hertz. Um, I think it sounds pretty nice as it is. It's lacking a bit of the low end, but as I say, because we've got the fat mic and we've got sort of the, uh, the closer microphones, it doesn't actually, it's not actually that necessary here. I'm also compressing using the SSL compressor as well. Finally, I've added a little bit of reverb. This is the room for snare drum. And you can see here that I've increased the stereo width to 82%. So that gives it a nice sort of room signature. But what really adds to it is this room microphone. Now, mistakenly, and actually it works out pretty well, I forgot to turn on the pad setting for this. This microphone has a little switch where you can go from zero to minus 20 dB, and I forgot to do it. So in the end, this microphone was actually clipping when it was recording, but actually it worked out pretty well. The first thing I did is I created a sample delay of 35 samples, and for this, it was just to give it a little bit more of the sense of the room. So I positioned it back by just 0.7 milliseconds but it just sort of gives it a little bit of a slap. Then I used the CLA-3A and I'm quite, I'm quite heavy with this. Now this is a relatively fast attack but I don't know it, it doesn't we're losing a sense of the transient so the next thing I did is I went in here and added a really aggressive fast attack fast release on this uh, CLA-76 by Waves. This just really squashes the dynamic range of the room until there isn't really any sense of room anymore. It's just sort of a wash of everything that's going on. Next, I use the CQ to add a little bit of attitude. 
and you can see I'm using the drive settings again. I really like how that sounds. And finally, I used a Pro R just to make it sound a little bit more stereo. If I just blend that in now with the rest of the microphones, you can see how it works with everything else. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, please do click thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't done already. Lots of really exciting videos to come. I'd be really interested to see what you think of this drum tone of 2020. It's got far more punch and attack than I'm kind of used to really, but I tend to do a bit of a cull of my presets about once every year. And this is the tone that I've just come to love in 2020. So I thought I would make this little video for you. I'd also be really interested to see what you would do with these stems. So do download them for free down below if you want to experiment with them yourself. Be really interested to see what you think of the Greg Wells fat mic technique and also just some of the other microphone choices. But also let me know if you've got any recommendations for new techniques, positions or microphones for me to try out. I'd be really interested to see that. Until next time, stay safe, stay well and I'll see you all in the next video.